Okay, so I'm going to talk about cosmic order and design. So from ancient times, Jews and Christians have argued that the existence of God can be known from his works. That is, creation itself points to its creator. This is stated clearly in scripture, as in the beginning of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. The Book of Wisdom, from which I quoted uh, in my previous lecture or talk, says that from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. This is echoed by St. Paul, and actually if you read both St. Paul, this passage from St. Paul and the passage from Wisdom, you see St. Paul almost certainly had Wisdom, Book of Wisdom in mind. When he said in his letter to the Romans, Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. The same theme is taken up by early Christian writers, such as St. Irenaeus in the second century, who writes, creation itself reveals him who created it, and the work made is itself suggestive of him who, that made it. And the world manifests him that arranged it. So what is it about creation that reveals God? Most fundamentally, of course, it's the very fact that the world exists at all. There's no a priori necessity that there be a world. And so its existence must have a cause, the cause of being, or causa ascendi, as I discussed in my first talk. But there's another fundamental fact about the world that calls for an explanation namely that it is orderly. So St. Gregory of, is it Nazianzus? That's how I always thought it was pronounced anyway. In the late fourth century writes, let us even suppose that the existence of the world is spontaneous. To what will you ascribe its order? The argument that the orderliness of nature points to God is a major theme in early Christian writing. I quoted one example in my previous talk, namely the words of Minucius Felix writing around 200 AD. In the home of this world, when you see providence, order, and law in the heavens and on earth, believe that there is a Lord and author of the universe more beautiful than the stars themselves and the various parts of the whole world. The great theologian Origen, writing around 250 AD, says, when we are convinced by what we see in the excellent orderliness of the world, then we worship its maker as the one author of one effect, which, since it is entirely in harmony with itself, cannot therefore have been the work of many makers. Lactantius, writing around 300 AD, says, there is no one so uncivilized, nor of such barbarous manners, that he does not, when he raises his eyes to heaven, understand something from the very magnitude of things, their motion, arrangement, constancy, beauty, and proportion, and that this could not possibly be if it were not established in wonderful order, having been fashioned on some greater design. Saint Athanasius, writing shortly after that, says, creation, as if in written characters, and by means of its order and harmony, declares in a loud voice its own master and creator, and goes on to say, God, by his own word, gave to creation such order as is found therein, so that though he is by nature invisible, men might be able to know him through his works. Of course, they're, they're all echoing St. Paul, of course. St. Gregory of Nyssa, in the late fourth century, says, all creation." And above all, as the scripture says, the orderly arrangement of the heavens demonstrates the wisdom of the creator through the skill displayed in his works. Saint Cyril of Alexandria, writing in the mid fifth century says, from the origination of the world and from its order and beauty, we can recognize that the wisdom and power of him who created it and brought it into existence far surpasses every created mind. So, not, I don't think students would know what this means, but they're like a broken record, right? They're all saying it's order, order, order. It's law, it's harmony, it's beauty. 
Now this argument is sometimes called the argument from design or a version of the argument from design. Unfortunately, the idea of design or the word design has been taken over to a large extent by something called the intelligent design movement or ID movement that started in the late 1990s. This movement uses a certain version of a certain kind of design argument uh, to attack Darwinian evolution. In particular, what they claim is that Darwinian <coughs> evolution, Darwinian mechanisms cannot explain certain types of very complex structures found in the biological world, and that these, therefore, are evidence of a designer. I don't want to get into the subject of evolution in this talk, because I'm here to talk about physics, not biology, but I want to point out three ways in which the ID movement's design argument is different from the ancient argument for the existence of God that you find in these passages from the church fathers and the early Christian writing. First, the ID movement looks for evidence of design only in phenomena that they think cannot be explained in a natural way. That is, in things that supposedly depart from or exceed the natural order. By contrast, the ancient argument one finds in these passages is that nature itself points to God, since nature is God's handiwork. As I noted in my second talk, both scripture and early Christian writings generally cite perfectly natural phenomena as evidence of God. Second, the ID movement focuses on biological phenomena exclusively, and in particular the structures of living things. One sees, however, that both scripture and early Christian writings are not focused on biology specifically. They're more concerned with the order of the cosmos as a whole. Yes, the living world, world of living things, but also the heavens and the seas and, and everything in the, in, the, in the universe. In fact, they mostly use astronomical examples. Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. Benusius Felix extols the providence, order, and law in the heavens and on earth. Lactantius refers to what we see, quote, when we raise our eyes to heaven. St. Athanasius speaks of the orderly arrangement of the heavens. St. Gregory of Nyssa even says that what points to the creator is, quote, above all the orderly arrangement of the heavens. So they're not, they're not obsessed with, biologi with biological examples. Third, the ID movement focuses entirely on the complexity of things. That's the big argument. It, things are, complexity points to design. Whereas the central focus of the ancient Christian writings was on the beauty, order, harmony, and lawfulness of the world. So it, it is helpful, therefore, to see, use different terms for the two types of argument. And so I will call the kind that I've been talking, to, uh, talking about uh, uh, in, in, in quoting these passages in reference to uh, the cosmic design argument and the kind made by the ID movement of the biological design argument. Now, I'm not denying that in ancient Jewish and Christian writings, something like a biological design argument can be found. An example might be this verse from Psalm 139. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. Saint Irenaeus also uses the human form as an example. The formation of man reveals the artificer who formed him. And the following passage of St. Augustine, which either is the same or very similar to one that Father uh, Terry Ehrman qu uh, quoted the other day from St. Augustine, he points to living things as well as, uh, as examples. Ask the world the beauty of the heavens, the splendor and arrangement of the stars, the sun that suffices for the day, the moon, the comfort of the night. Ask the earth fruitful in herbs and trees, full of animals, adorned with men, Ask the sea filled with so many swimming creatures of every kind. Ask the air replete with so many flying creatures. Ask them all and see if they do not, as if in a language of their own, answer you, God made us. Noble philosophers, too, have sought these things and have recognized the artisan by the art. There's a third kind of design argument that one can find in, in Christian writings, early Christian writings, which is based on the idea that the various parts of the universe and of the earth, have been arranged for the benefit of living things and most especially for our benefit. And, 
and to provide for our needs. I'll call this the providential design argument. So here's an example from the letter of Clement, St. Clement, that I uh, quoted uh, parts of uh, in my second talk. Season by season, the teeming earth, obedient to his will, causes a wealth of nourishment to spring forth for man and beast and every living thing upon its surface. Um, so and so forth, and then it says, the ever-flowing streams created for our well-being and enjoyment offer their breasts unfailingly for the life of man. So another example. Oh, is that right? Ah, next one, yes. Another one from about 180 AD, St. Theophilus of Antioch. Consider, O oh man, his works, the changes of the seasons, it's at times, the changes in weather, the well-ordered course of the planets. Notice they always start with astronomy and, and, and the, the well-ordered progress of days and nights and months and years. The providence by which God arranges that, the, that nourishment is at hand for all flesh and the subjection in which he has ordained that all things are subservient to, to mankind. So that's the providential design argument I, I would call, I call that. Now, how do the various kinds of design arguments uh, stand up in the light of what we now know about the natural world? The biological design argument, especially the version used by the ID movement, which is based on biological complexity, is very vulnerable to new discoveries in biology because natural selection is a mechanism that, at least in principle, can fashion complex structures out of less complex structures. So we, but we've seen that, that the argument, the ar design argument for the existence of God based on biological complexity is not really the oldest and most traditional argument for the existence of God. In fact, I think it received relatively little emphasis before modern times. At first glance, it looks as though the Darwinian, as though Darwinian evolution might also seriously undermine the providential design argument. It, Atheists argue that the, that the wonderful suitability of environments for the living things that inhabit them is not due to the wise designs of providence, but merely to life gradually adapting by natural selection to whatever environment it happens to find itself in. So to put it crudely, God did not create trees in order for monkeys to climb them, but monkeys adapt, there were trees around and monkeys adapted to their environment and became good at climbing trees. So now biology, so Darwinism, Darwinian evolution may undercut to some extent this kind of providential design argument by showing how it is that creatures are and, and environments are well adapted to each other. But biology doesn't have the last word here. As I, um, mentioned in my first talk, there would not be any environments in the universe that were, that were habitable by living things at all if it weren't for the fact that the laws of physics and the certain basic features of the universe, of the physical universe, had particular features which I told you were called anthropic coincidences. <clears throat> so you could argue, at, take the argument back a step to the level of fundamental physics and say that the laws of physics were providentially arranged in such a way as to make the universe capable of having habitable places in it. And so that, so the providential design argument is still alive and well. Though I think it's, as I said, better, it's stronger, it's, it's, it's more robust if you make it from the level of fundamental physics, I think, than from the level of biology. But for, most, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to be talking about the, what I call the cosmic design argument. I'm going to show you that it is very robust. The discoveries of modern, the, the argument that's based on the lawfulness and the orderliness of nature. The discoveries of modern science cannot undercut that argument for the simple reason that all explanations in modern science are based on the fact that nature is orderly and lawful. All scientific explanations are based on the premise that the universe is orderly and lawful. 
Now, in fact, I'm going to argue that the discoveries of modern physics <clears throat> by revealing the, the, the cosmic order is much more profound and impressive than had previously been imagined. Ha, the, that fact has enormously strengthened the most ancient and traditional argument for the existence of God. The more we discover scientifically, the stronger the cosmic argu design argument becomes. Now, as I emphasized in my second talk, Jews and Christians have always attributed the order in nature to God as lawgiver. Many early Christian writers refer to God as giving ordinances, decrees, and laws to nature. But modern atheists and materialists, paradoxically, they see the lawfulness of nature as a reason not to believe in God. Indeed, they argue that the laws of nature are themselves the ultimate explanation of all the order we see in the natural world. So that you can just take, leave God aside. You don't need God, just take the laws. The laws of nature are sufficient to explain everything. You don't need to have an organizing intelligence behind it all. Now, atheists have reasons for what they say, and I want to go into those in this talk, but I think it's important to understand the thinking of atheists if we're going to answer them effectively. And I think they have reasons that have to be taken seriously. If you, do cons if you consider objects, tangible objects, and phenomena that we observe around us on the earth and in the heavens, whether it's flowers or rainbows or the structure of the solar system, and so on. We find that their orderly structures and patterns can be explained in a naturalistic way by appealing to the forces of nature and the equations that govern them. Take a, 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 a prime example. Consider the order in the heavens, which Minucius Felix spoke of in 200 AD. This order in the heavens not only uh, is involves the order that it contains the order that was known to ancient peoples, but also to the marvelous geometrical patterns that were discovered by astronomers such as Johannes Kepler and by all the order, all the order that was that been discovered by modern astronomy and astrophysics. And all of that order in, uh, that, say, Kepler and other modern astronomers discovered, all that order was shown in the 1700s to be explainable in detail by Newton's laws of gravity and mechanics. Or consider a terrestrial example, the formation of crystals. Under certain conditions, atoms or molecules that were moving around randomly in a liquid or a gas arranged themselves without any external help into very regular arrays, crystals. This happens when water freezes, for example. When the temperature of water is above the freezing point, the water molecules move around in a random way. But when the temperature is lowered to the freezing point, the molecules begin to line up rank upon rank in hexagonal patterns. These patterns can be of remarkable beauty, as in the case of snowflakes or the feathery frost patterns on windows on winter mornings. This lining up of the molecules in mathematically precise patterns happens spontaneously and automatically. Aimless molecular motions end up producing a highly ordered structure. There is no traffic policeman directing this process and telling this molecule, you go here and this one, you go there. It happens by itself as a consequence of the laws of physics, a natural and well-understood consequence of the laws of physics. So who's right? Do the laws of nature prove that God is needed as a lawgiver or that he is superfluous? To address this question, I, we have to look more closely at the laws of nature and the role they play in physical explanation. The ancient argument that the order of nature points to God is based on the common sense idea that if something is arranged, then someone arranged it. The apparent reasonableness of this idea can be seen from an everyday example. Suppose you enter a hall and find hundreds of folding chairs 
neatly placed in evenly spaced ranks and files in a rectangular array like that. You would feel justified in concluding that somebody had arranged them. You could look at that and say, yeah, somebody arranged those chairs. But you can imagine somebody come up to you and say, no, no, nobody arranged those chairs. That's, that's silly. That's naive. They're, they are obeying a law of chairs. <laughs> there is a law of chairs that causes, that those chairs are obeying. It makes them look that way. Now, that's obviously absurd, but on the other hand, there is a law of chairs. There is a law of chairs that the chairs are obeying, in a sense. And the, the, that law, in the, there's a law of chairs in the sense that there's a mathematical rule or formula that tells you how the chairs are arranged. So that if you knew the position of a few chairs and you knew that mathematical rule, you could predict the positions of all the other chairs. So there is a law of chairs. But what is this law of chairs, really? When you come right down to it, it's just another way of saying that the placement of chairs exhibits a pattern. The law in question does not explain the existence of the pattern. It doesn't tell you why there is a pattern. It merely precisely describes the pattern. It states the pattern. Okay. Now, <clears throat> another point that one has to keep in mind is that there are different kinds of laws. Some laws have to be true. There's no possible way that they could not be true. For example, the laws of arithmetic and the laws of logic. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is, follows from the laws of arithmetic. But we don't believe there's a lawgiver that gave the law, that ordained the laws of arithmetic. They are what they are. They have to be that way in the laws of logic. Indeed, medieval theologians said, at least most of them uh, said, that even God could not violate the laws of logic or the laws of, of mathematics. Now, so these laws, logic and arithmetic, are laws that cannot be otherwise. But the law of chairs, which is a kind of a law, a rule, a mathematical rule, <laughs> describing that pattern, could have been different. It's not a necessary law. The chairs could have been placed in some other pattern. Or maybe they could have been placed in a way where there was no pattern at all. Now, the fact that this pattern, this law of chairs, or this pattern is not a necessary thing and could have been otherwise is one reason, not the only reason, but one reason that we say, well, that somebody must have chosen that pattern. Someone must have chosen that law as opposed to other laws or no law. Now, the critical point is that the laws of nature, the laws of physics, are not like the laws of logic and mathematics in the sense that they couldn't have been otherwise. No physicist believes that. I mean, if it were so, you, could, you wouldn't have to go out and do experiments. You could sit in your living room, just like you can sit and do mathematics without observing anything, or you can figure out the laws of logic just by sitting in a chair you would be able to figure out the laws of physics that way. You can't. You have to, because the laws of physics aren't necessary. They could be, there's an infinite number of possible patterns or laws that the universe could obey. You have to go out and see which ones actually are obeyed by doing experiments. Now, so they're like, the laws of nature are like the laws, uh, the law of chairs. They could have been otherwise. And that's one reason that theists, including ourselves, argue and ancient Christian writers, that the laws of nature were chosen. They're the product of a mind, as the, this law is. Now, it might seem that the atheist, therefore, is saying something silly when he says that the laws of nature would allow you to get rid of a lawgiver or design. It looks like we, you know, okay, we've had that argument and we come out on top. But actually, there's more to be said for the atheist point of view. There's more to be said for the atheist point of view, and I think it's important to understand it. So inst and instead of thinking of this chair analogy, let's think of a different analogy to get to see how they look at things. Imagine that you have a box with ball bearings rolling around in the bottom, like one of those little games where you're supposed to get the ball bearings to go into the, the, the holes. So you have a box, a lot of ball bearings, and they're rolling around aimlessly, and, so, and then you tilt the box, and the ball bearings slide down into the corner, 
And what you will find is that they will form a nice hexagonal pattern, especially if you jiggle the box a little bit. The pattern that emerges is called the hexagonal closest packing pattern. Now, it's the same pattern that you see in oranges on a fruit stand, and I think that's a picture of eggs of some kind of insect on a leaf. Hexagonal closest packing. Okay. Now, notice a point here. The ball bearings, whereas the chairs, someone came in and arranged them, as it were, by hand, the ball bearings arranged themselves in this pattern by themselves. They arranged themselves in this pattern. And they do so because of both physical laws and mathematical laws. There is are physical laws which require the ball bearings to settle down into the lowest energy configuration that they can reach. They're trying to minimize their gravitational potential energy. And this forces them to squeeze tightly as they can down into the bottom corner, into the corner of the box. And it's a mathematical law which says that the tightest way to pack spheres is in such a hexagonal array. So here we really do seem to have a case where the orderliness emerges from a pre-existing chaos of the balls rolling around randomly just by the operation of laws. In the law of chairs example, the law was just another way of describing the pattern. But here, there are laws that really do seem to explain why the pattern emerges, why there is a pattern. Now it would appear to justify the claim that order can spring forth spontaneously and necessarily from disorder by unconscious laws rather than by the designing hand of an intelligent agent. This is how atheists look upon the laws of nature in relation to the universe. And much in nature, indeed the whole history of the cosmos, seems to support this view. After the Big Bang, there was just a lot of the universe is filled with gas. Gravitation made that chaotically swirling gas condense into clusters of galaxies and then galaxies and then stars and then planets, stars and planets. The same forces made those stars and planets settle into orderly uh, arrangements like our solar system. On the surfaces of planets, electrical forces caused chemicals to clump together to form molecules, smaller molecules than larger and more elaborate molecules, until at last molecules that could replicate themselves appeared. And eventually biology began. And then you went from simple creatures to more complicated creatures. This is the grand picture. Order emerging spontaneously from disorder or chaos and presiding over the whole drama, the atheist tells us, is not some intelligent agent, but blind physical forces and mathematical necessity. Now this account of the history of the cosmos is up to a point undoubtedly correct. But the lessons that the atheist draws from it are based on a superficial view of science. It is a view that leaves out of a large major part of what science has taught us about the world may be the most important part. The overlooked point is this. When examined carefully, the scientific accounts of natural processes are never really about order emerging from mere chaos or form emerging from mere formlessness. On the contrary, they're always about the unfolding of an order that was already implicit in the nature of things Though, although often in a secret or hidden way. In physics, when we see situations that appear haphazard or things that appear amorphous, so auto automatically or spontaneously, quote, arranging themselves into orderly patterns, we find in every case that what appeared to be amorphous or haphazard actually had a great deal of order already built into it. I'll illustrate this with a simple example of the ball bearings in the box. And what we'll learn is the following important principle. Order has to be built in for order to come out. We saw that if we tip the box, the ball bearings form an orderly arrangement. Why does that happen? 
Suppose I did the same thing, not with a box of ball bearings, but with my living room. <coughs> I hired a huge crane to come and tilt my living room so that everything slid into a corner. I wouldn't end up with a nice orderly pattern, but a jumbled heap of lamps, furniture, books, and miscellaneous objects. Why don't the ball bearings form a jumbled heap? Part of the reason is that unlike the objects in my living room, the ball bearings have exactly the same size and shape. But that's not the whole story. After all, if I were to put in a bunch of identical spoons, all the same size and shape, into a box and jiggle it, I'd end up with a jumble. There would be a jumbled heap with the spoons pointing every which way. But it is a particular, but the, the the difference with the ball bearings is that not only are they all the same shape, like the spoons, but the ball bearings have a particularly simple and symmetrical shape, a sphere. In fact, the sphere is the most symmetrical three-dimensional shape possible because it looks exactly the same from any angle. No matter what angle you look at a, a sphere, it looks the same. So when ball bearings fall into a corner, it doesn't matter very much how they fall. Spoons or furniture will point every which way and look like a jumble, but spheres cannot point every which way because a sphere, no matter which way it is turned, looks just the same. So the, even before the box was tilted and the, even when the ball bearings were moving around randomly, there were at least two principles of order already present and governing the situation. One, every ball bearing had the same size and shape as every other ball bearing, and two, each ball bearing had the perfectly symmetrical shape of a sphere. So the order that seemed to emerge spontaneously in, this, in the hexagonal pattern was actually the consequence, the outgrowth of an order that was already present in the structure of the, of the ball bearings themselves, even when they were rolling around randomly. Moreover, we'll now see that the order that emerged in this pattern was in a certain sense less than the order that was already there. Some of the order that we're talking about in this situation is of the kind that mathematicians and physicists call symmetry. Symmetry plays a central role in modern physics. To a mathematician or a physicist, a symmetry is a transformation something you do. A symmetry is a transformation that you do to something that leaves it looking the same as it did before. So for example, here's this hexagonal pattern. If I were to rotate this pattern by 60 degrees so that this line went up to here, so I rotate it by 60 degrees, this hexagon will look exactly the same as it did before. There, there are therefore six rotational symmetries, as mathematicians would say, of a hexagon. Th this, those symmetries are rotating by zero degrees. That's a symmetry, because if you don't rotate it at all, it looks the same. By 60 degrees, by 120 degrees, by 180 degrees, by 240 degrees, and by 300 degrees. So the hexagon has six rotational symmetries. Now, spheres are also symmetric. They have an infinite number of symmetries. And in fact, they're, because you can rotate a sphere by any angle about any axis, and it will look just the same. And those infinite number of symmetries of a sphere include the six symmetries of a hexagon, because if you rotate a sphere by 60 degrees or 120 or 180 and so on, it will look the same. But it has an infinite number of symmetries, not just six. So the symmetries that emerged in this hexagonal pattern when the ball bearings arranged themselves in the box was actually less than the symmetry that the ball bearings themselves had to begin with. And in fact, the, the symmetry that came out is a consequence of the symmetry that was already there. And so what physicists say in a situation like this is not that this hexagonal symmetry came out of nowhere. It actually came, it didn't spring forth from an eight, a non-symmetric situation. It actually is a remnant 
of a larger amount of symmetry that the ball bearings had. So we don't say that symmetry sort of came out of nowhere. We say, this physicist says, the existing symmetry of a sphere was broken to a lesser symmetry. Okay. So the symmetry of, the, of this hexagonal pattern didn't come from nowhere. It came from something more symmetric, through what was physicists call spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that's a very important concept in, modern, in fundamental physics. I told you that modern physics is, fundamental physics is to a large extent, symmetry plays a central role. And that would take several courses to explain that. But one thing that uh, is, we have discovered is that the fundamental laws of uh, forces of nature, there are four that we know about, electromagnetism, the strong force, the weak force, and gravity. Each of those forces is based on profound symmetries of the laws of nature. In fact, they spring, we regard in my field, even more fundamental than the fundamental particles or the fundamental forces or the fundamental laws are the fundamental symmetries, actually. Those are actually in, maybe the deepest things and most fundamental in nature. Now, it was known for at least 100 years that the force of electromagnetism is rooted in, is based on a fundamental symmetry that's called gauge symmetry or gauge invariance, gauge, G-A-U-G-E. And at first it appeared that the other basic forces of nature, the, the two of the other basic forces of nature, the strong and the weak, were not based on symmetries like that. However, in the 1960s and 70s, it was discovered that the weak force is also based on ga a type of that gauge symmetry, type of symmetry, but in fact on an even larger set of gauge symmetries, an even more intricate and interesting gauge symmetries than electromagnetism is. It took a long time to realize this, however, it took decades, because the gauge symmetries underlying the weak force are spontaneously broken. And therefore, they don't manifest themselves very obviously, except when you look at things very, at very small distances of very high energies. Now, this illustrates a general trend in modern physics, which is as we look more deeply into nature, we found that nature exhibits more mathematical order than was apparent on the surface. In, God bless you. In fact, it is believed that at an even deeper level, the three non-gravitational forces, electromagnetism, strong and weak, probably merge into a single so-called grand unified force. That's, a lot of my research has been on grand unified theories. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence for this. The grand unified force has a much larger set of symmetries than either electromagnetism or the weak force or the strong force have. These symmetries, the simplest grand unified theory, has deep symmetries which, to dis which are basically the symmetries of rotations, but not rotations like this in a plane. Rotations in a five-dimensional abstract space where the different dimensions are not described, the coordinates are not real numbers, but complex numbers. So you're rotating in five complex, complex numbers have the square root of minus one in them. You're ro doing rotations in five complex dimensions. That's the underlying symmetry of one of the simplest of these grand unified theories. So we're talking about very non-trivial uh, symmetries and patterns. By the way, here are some pictures. You can't actually visualize five complex dimensions, but there are certain diagrams associated with these grand unified theories which you can visualize, and you can see that these are very interesting, not trivial. Okay. Returning to the ball bearing in the box example, I'd point out that there were other principles, not just symmetry, there were other principles of order in the situation besides the shapes of the ball bearings. Remember I said that there was a physical principle that made the ball bearing settle into the configuration that had the lowest energy. That principle follows from a more general organizing principle of nature. So things, situations of the lowest energy are stable. That follows from a deeper principle which is historically called the principle of least action. 
And all of classical physics, all of pre-quantum mechanics, physics, everything, is based on the principle of least action. But then in the 20th century, it was found out that the principle of least action is actually based on a deeper principle that is governs, that's, that underlies quantum mechanics, called the, which we can call the path integral pr uh, principle, which is more subtle. Now, so you see that as you go deeper into nature, you find more interesting, rich principles and um, mathematical structure. Okay, so the deeper you go, the more order and structure you find. So consider the, or the motions of the heavenly bodies. 400 years ago, Kepler discovered his three laws of planetary motion, which are very beautiful. One of Kepler's laws is that the orbits of planets around the sun are not circles, but ellipses. Ellipses are very beautiful mathematical curves, very interesting mathematically. The ancient Greeks studied them, uh, ancient Greek mathematicians studied them quite a bit. Now, this beautiful, and there are two other laws Kepler discovered, very beautiful mathematically. It was discovered that these laws of Kepler followed from deeper laws discovered by Isaac Newton, his laws of mechanics and gravity. And then in the 20th century, it was discovered that Newton's laws of gravity actually were followed from deeper laws, namely Einstein's theory of gravity, called general relativity. And now we believe that Einstein's theory of general relativity is really just a reflection, an outcropping, as it were, a reflection of something even deeper which is probably, or very likely, what's called superstring theory. Now, the, the thing that's interesting about this, and this typical, is that Kepler's laws can be explained to, say, a middle school student or a bright elementary school student, Kepler's laws. You, it only takes a few minutes to explain what an ellipse is, and that the sun, and what the focus of the ellipse is, and that the sun is there, and that the planet goes in the ellipse. You could explain that in, a, in, in, in 10 minutes to a, a grade school student. But that, those laws are based, as I said, on Newton's laws of gravity and mechanics. To explain Newton's laws of gravity and mechanics, you need calculus. So you're probably talking about somebody who studied for weeks or months, a, a, a high school senior or a college freshman. Quite, more, quite a lot more sophisticated. But Newton's laws of gravity are based, as I said, on Einstein's deeper laws of gravity. Those you typically learn in graduate school, you have to have a lot more mathematical background. You have to know about, about four-dimensional, curved, non-Euclidean space-time, tensor analysis, and all sorts of things, like differential geometry, much more sophisticated and more beautiful. Superstring theory, or which probably underlies Einstein's theory of gravity, is so profound mathematically that it's, though it has been studied intensively since 1984 by thousands of the most brilliant physicists and mathematicians in the world, they still do not fully understand its mathematical structure. It's that deep. So as you see, the deeper you go, from Kepler to Newton to Einstein to superstring theory, all you see, you see more and more impressive structure and order. So when Minucius Felix praised the providence, order, and laws in the heavens and on earth, and many other Christian writer, ancient Christian theologians spoke of the order in creation, they spoke about something of which they only saw a tiny part Modern science has gone down much deeper into the roots of the world's workings, and what you see there is ever more impressive and sophisticated and subtle mathematical order. So science doesn't explain away the order. It's shown it to be greater and more beautiful than anyone had imagined. Now, you might 
worry that someday we'll, ex we'll be able to explain it away, but that's not going to happen for a simple reason. What's happened in the history of physics for the last 400 years, you're always explaining a law at one level by a deeper law, and that law by a deeper law and a deeper law. All physicists, virtually, I've never met one who doesn't think, believes that deep down there's a bedrock in which you have an ultimate set of laws of physics, below which you can go no deeper. That's the fundamental law. Those are the fundamental laws. Everything would then be explicable. All natural processes would be explicable in terms of those bedrock laws. Science would not explain those laws. It would just accept them as the way the world is because the way you explain laws is in, phys in physics is by deriving them from deeper laws. But those are, but are the deepest laws, so you're not going to derive them from anything else. Nor would they have evolved in some Darwinian fashion. You might imagine someone's coming along and saying, oh yeah, those laws, those deepest, most fundamental laws of nature are very beautiful, very sophisticated mathematics, but they're just the product of some process of evolution from something simpler. However, any natural process of evolution is going to have to be governed by laws. If it's a natural process of evolution, there's going to be laws governing it. So it would then be those laws that were the fundamental ones. You can't get away from it. So the labors of physicists have therefore not weakened the old argument from design. Oh, I should say the same thing is true with crystals. Crystals have all this beautiful symmetry, but they're made up of atoms. And those atoms have, these are the energy levels, some of them, of the hydrogen atom. Okay? And you see, atoms themselves are highly symmetric structures. And below atoms, you have the subatomic level. And there's a lot of mathematical structure at the subatomic level. So you, the deeper you go, as I said, the more order you find. In 1931, Hermann Weyl, one of the greatest mathematicians and mathematical physicists of the 20th century, in fact, he's the one that discovered these gauge symmetries I told you about, gave a lecture at Yale University. He said the following. Many people think that modern science is far removed from God. I find, on the contrary, that it is much more difficult today for the knowing person to approach God from history, from the spiritual side of the world, and from morals. For there, we encounter the suffering and evil in the world, which it is difficult to bring into harmony with an all-merciful and almighty God. In this domain, we have evidently not yet succeeded in raising the veil with which our human nature covers the essence of things. But in our knowledge of physical nature, we have penetrated so far that we can obtain a vision of the flawless harmony, which is in conformity with sublime reason. Logos, if you will, sublime reason. He was a religious believer, by the way. The argument that the orderliness of nature points to God was made by the early fathers of the church. But the same argument appeals also to the modern mind. I'm now going to quote two eminent scientists of our time about the orderliness of nature. Neither of them is religious. The first is Professor Avraham Loeb, an astrophysicist at Harvard, who uh, actually is the head of the, I think the head of the department that Karen Oberg is a member of. And she tells me he is a very, you know, he's a very committed atheist. However, he was, he was being interviewed by something, and the interviewer began to think that Loeb had some strange ideas. And so the interviewer thought, oh, this guy Loeb has some strange ideas. Maybe he's religious. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked Loeb, he said, are you religious? And Loeb said, I was secular to start with. I'm not religious. I am struck by the order we find in the universe, the order we find in the universe, by the regularity, by the existence of laws of nature. That is something I'm always in awe of, how the laws of nature we find here on Earth seem to apply all the way out to the edge of the universe. That is quite remarkable. The universe could have been chaotic and very disorganized, but it obeys a set of laws much better than people obey a set of laws here. <laughs> now notice, he, 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 he says, and Karen told me the other day, Professor Oberg told me, 
No, he's an atheist and has insisted that he's an atheist. But notice, he was asked if he was really, he didn't have to get into all this discussion of order. He was asked, are you religious? And he said, I was secular to start with. I'm not religious, but I'm struck by all this order and lawfulness. See? The second quote is by Edward Witten. Ed Witten, who, as I told you, quoted in a previous talk, is regarded as the most brilliant physicist of his generation. And he re described himself in an, in an interview with a journalist as a skeptical agnostic. Maybe he was just being polite, and maybe he just means an atheist, but he said, I'm a skeptical agnostic. But and at, at some point in the interview, he, he said this about the laws of physics. The laws of nature, as they've been uncovered in the last few centuries, and especially in the last century, are very surprising. They are very subtle. They've got a great beauty which is a little hard to describe, maybe, if one hasn't experienced it. The laws as we know them are very beautiful mathematically. They involve very interesting and subtle concepts. It is a rich story, and it all hangs together beautifully. The universe is built, is not put together. It's not a, a, a simple-minded structure put together with tinker toys or Legos. The, the, the architecture of this physical universe is, is, is very, based on very subtle, deep, intricate, rich mathematical ideas. Subtle concepts. And that suggests to some people that, they're the, that these laws, these patterns we find in nature are the product of a mind. And not just a mind, but a mind of supreme, <laughs> of a mind vastly more powerful, vastly deeper than our minds. Thank you. OK, so we have time for some question and answers. No physics. This is all physics. They, people don't like physics. <laughs> oh, okay. Again, this is more of a comment than a question. A question, but you know, as much as C.S. Lewis has been brought up in the seminar, um, when you're talking about all the fundamental laws, you know, I just came to mind. You know, he ta at the end of the line, the witch in the wardrobe talks about the deep magic and deeper magic, sort of the whole fundamental, you know, that's there at the beginning of time, there at the dawn, and there at the beginning. It's interesting, too, that at science, the same thing. You have, deeper you go, you've got this fundamental baseline that everything is going to sort of fall into. Right. And so it just sort of came to, that idea sort of came to mind, even from C.S. Lewis, sort of interweaving that into his books as well. Right. And I, I should emphasize, there are certain senses in which you could say the laws of physics change from place to place or from one time to another, possibly, though that's very speculative. However, for example, in the multiverse idea, as I talked about a little bit the other day, you know, it could be that I said that the mass of certain particle, mass of the electron could be different here in some other place. It could actually be, and this is not a very hard thing to uh, arrange, so to speak. In grand unified theories, this can happen very easily. That in one part of the universe, you have certain forces, a weak, electromagnetic, uh, strong. But in a remote part, there could be different forces. Um, however, in all those scenarios, at least as 99.9% .9 of people in fundamental physics would think, in all such scenarios, those are just different manifestations of some ultimate, much deeper set of laws. So there, I think almost everyone in my field believes that there's an ultimate set of fundamental laws, which is the same throughout space and time. It's always, they've always been uh, uh, in, in force, and they always will be everywhere. 
but they are have they, those fundamental laws might have a certain flexibility built into them in the sense where they can manifest themselves in different ways in different places depending on conditions and so on. But um, yeah, so that's that's the the view that almost all physicists have, and at least fundamental physicists, that there is at rock bottom some set of laws that are just that hold everywhere throughout the universe, except possibly with miracles. Here I have a, probably a little bit different way of thinking than John O'Callaghan. Uh, I, I may, he doesn't like the word the miracles violate the laws of nature, but he was uh, willing to say that they, what is it, that, uh, that God could suspend the laws of nature. I mean, um, there are laws of nature, and there are some, mir so there are some miracles that we believe, uh, such as turning water into wine, such as uh, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, which, uh, while if you really stood on your head and were incredibly clever, you could think of ways that that could happen without violating the laws of nature, but, but th those almost certainly did not s had events happen which, for example, involved energy not being conserved, for example, and things like that, which would involve, if, as I say, if the laws of nature are patterns, those patterns did not hold at the, there. So in that sense, if the laws of nature are patterns, mathematical regularities are patterns, there, there are these extraordinary events where the pattern or the regularity simply doesn't hold. Uh, yeah. um, my daughters have gone through STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, math, and um, I saw the, the phrase STEAM and they kind of rolled their eyes like, oh, you know, well, that's just a way that people tried to figure out how to put art into the whole equation. But your entire talk could easily be placed into a STEAM concept. There's no question. In fact, is, is it stream or STEAM? Stream. There's, okay. What's the R? Okay, sorry, they went to public school, right. so. <laughs> in fact, I could give you many quotes, and I, I have them somewhere on my laptop, of famous physicists who say be beauty is a guiding principle. In, in the 20th century, mathematical beauty became a guiding principle in searching for deeper theories. They were guided by aesthetic criteria. Uh, so, for example, Paul Dirac, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, he, uh, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, he discovered an equation called the Dirac equation, which is what's obeyed by particles like electrons, quarks, and so on. And the Dirac equation has been called one of the great achievements of 20th century physics. He found that equation by, because he was looking at certain mathematics, and he, this is what he said, and he found the mathematics so beautiful that he felt it must be important. He said, I was playing around with some mathematics which was very pretty. He said, it was so pretty that I knew it must be of some importance, and it led him to this equation. And he, there's a famous quote that he gave, that he's, uh, a statement he's uh, made, that it is more important to have beauty in your equations than to have them fit the experimental data. Okay. Uh, Heisenberg, I could give quotes from Heisenberg from many others. Uh, Heisenberg, I think, said that in, in science as in art, beauty is a source of illumination and clarity or something. A source of a, beauty is a, is a guiding principle. And uh, as Ed, unfortunately, one of the problems is, as Ed Witten says, it's a little hard to describe that beauty. There are some kinds of beauty that everybody can see, the beauty of a sunset, the beauty of a flower. The trouble is, the atheist can explain, not the atheist, the scientist can explain how the flower arose. He can explain, or she can explain sunsets and, and, and rainbows. Refraction of the raindrops are spheres, they refract light in a certain way, you can explain the, the colors of the rainbow. So the trouble is all the tangible, or crystals, all the tangible examples of beauty, the things you can see with your sense, uh, uh, know by your senses, a lot of that can be explained. The deepest level of nature, the beauty in superstring theory or grand unified theories, the beauty in the equations that Dirac talked about, 
not too many people in this world, maybe a few thousand, can see that beauty because they don't even know. Mathematical beauty is not very beautiful to most people in this world. It's like the, now everyone can appreciate the beauty of a, of, a, of a piece of music, of a Mozart or a Bach concerto or something. But what about the beauty of a chess game? That's more akin to this. There's a, to a chess masterpiece, there are some that are staggeringly beautiful but you have to be a very, very strong chess player to appreciate that. And that's one of the pr problems we face is that the deepest beauty in nature, the one that the atheist can't explain because the atheist, atheists do never, never seem to ask themselves the following question, where do the fundamental laws of physics come from? Why are they there? And as I said, you can't, they, they can't be explained scientifically. But that, and, and those are very beautiful, but you have to take the word of Ed Witten and people like that, or Herman Weil, that they are beautiful. You can't show your sixth graders, or your eighth graders, or tenth graders that beauty. Because, so that, that's one of the problems we face. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, Dr. Barr, I was yeah. going back to your, um, the, the, the often ancients and church fathers referencing Psalm 19, and I've always been amazed at Psalm 19. Have you found anybody who not only took the first half of the psalm, but also brought in the second half of the psalm, which says that the law of the Lord is perfect, the law of Yahweh is perfect. I mean, obviously for reference to Torah, but also perhaps to see that as the laws within the, within the universe that are governing the universe as well. And, though I'm not good at quoting scripture accurately, but I know there are many passages talking about the law, the beauty of the delighting in God's laws, you know, loving God's laws, the, the beauty of God's laws. You certainly, that's true of the physical world. The laws that God ordained are beautiful. To the eye of the mathematician and the physicist. <laughs> Not to the, eye, the eyes of the student struggling with inclined planes in his high school physics class. But, because that's unfortunate. The laws you learn there don't really show the beauty so much. Anyway. Um, you used the example of the ball bearings forming uh -huh. a, hexa a, hex a hexagonal pattern to talk about how that's actually an example of going from greater order to more right. disorder. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that example and the implications on something like maybe Big Bang cosmology, because it seems that we're going towards greater order, right? Right. Um, no, in Big, yeah, in Big Bang cosmology, we're going towards less. Uh, Right. Actually, uh, when it comes to the um, arrangement of things, how things are or arranged in space, you typically go from order to disorder. So, um, in a classic example, in a game of pool, you, you, can, you never see the pool balls, if they're just moving around randomly, rearranged into a triangular array. But when you break the rack, uh, pool balls, they go from order to disorder. And that is true throughout cosmic history. It's true every day of our lives that uh, uh, disorder is usually has to do with the way matters arranged in space and so forth. And you tend to go into more disorganized. But as I said, you can have special cases where locally you can get something more, a more orderly structure emerging, but it's always at the expense of more entropy and disorder somewhere else. Uh, so, as a whole, the universe is moving towards disorder, and that's why all life is going to perish. We're all going to die and decay and decompose, and all the stars are going to burn out, and all that usable, organized energy that allows things, to, work to be done, and thing, is all going to dissipate in the form of heat, and 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 we're going to end up with a cold featureless universe with nothing left in it except this wispy um, heat radiation, <laughs> very little. So I mean, yeah, think, it's depressing. That, but, but, um, <laughs> um, but in a sense, so yeah, but, but there are, now I gave you an example where order emerged in the arrangement of the ball bearings when they, but so, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't situations where locally order. So water can freeze and turn in. Ice crystals are just like the ball bearings. Just, just like the ball bearings are going around aimlessly and then they organize into this pattern. And when you freeze water, the molecules organize themselves into a crystal. But, um, but um, 
you know, generally the, uh, the tendency is towards disorder. Which raises the weird, the strange and unanswered question of how it was that there was so much order at the beginning of the universe, uh, so little, so low entropy that's not understood. Uh, I, mine's not so much a question as a comment on the idea of the great beauty um, and kind of maybe an encouragement to all my colleagues here to, to allow science to be an entrance into theology in that I had an experience with a um, Chinese exchange student uh, never having experienced church in any sense of the word, uh, but had a passion for math that I can't explain. Um, and he couldn't really explain. And then when he was forced to do a project on love was the first time that he said he understood his passion of math was about a desire for the infinite. There's infinite possibilities in numbers. And that was the first time he ever understood like what we were talking about as far as like infinite love in God. And so it was like really mind blowing to me to, that, that he came to his first experience of infinite through the beauty of math. So for like the sake of the conference to emphasize that um, I think is really important. Yeah, I think beauty, uh, the, there are three classic uh, transcendentals, the beauty, truth and goodness, which we seek. And I think it was Dostoevsky who said that the modern world has kind of cut down the tree of truth <laughs> and it's cut down the tree of goodness, but the beauty, tree of beauty still stands and it, reach, and it reaches up to that place that we're trying to attain. And I think the, you can see it if a mathematically minded person may find it in the beauty of math or the beauty of physics or the beauty of music. I think the church has to get back into putting more beauty into things. There's a conference on the liturgy going on here. Restore be beauty. Be uh, beauty is a very, I think Pope Benedict also talked about it. Beauty is a very power. The church has to reflect goodness. We haven't done a very good job in recent decades. Reflect its truth but it also has to show forth the beauty of God. So, yeah. You mentioned that um, for many, most normal people, the uh, laws of physics are not accessible, uh, which I would agree with that. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I here? Ah, okay. And um, I think that even though you don't understand the laws, you can still see the beauty that they reveal um, and appreciate that, and the example that I would use is, I don't know the first thing about how to write a symphony, but when I hear a beautiful symphony, I know there are laws that determine how yes. that goes together. I don't have to know those laws to still appreciate yes. the, the beauty of it. I think that's a good thing. You, point. You should say to the students or to the young people or whoever, the adult atheist, all this beauty you see, yes, you can explain some aspects I don't, of, of this beauty around you, the crystals, the sunsets, the rainbows, and so on and so forth trees and animals, but you're always explaining in, a, in terms of something deeper, and you may not know what that deeper thing is, but those deeper things are even in a way more beautiful, and, and uh, so that's, that's the line, sort of the line of attack that I'm using. And then at some point you have to take someone's word for it. Yeah, there's deeper stuff under that, but that's even more rich, more intricate, more beautiful, even though that's a sort of, an, for most people, an unseen beauty. So um, thank you very much for everything. Um, you said that scientists, physicists especially, have been amazed about the beauty and order in the universe and these laws of nature, but they do not know where they they have not been able to figure out where these fundamental laws of physics come from or why they are there, and that has been especially for some of them who are atheists, that has been the, the, um, the challenge between um, remaining atheists or believing in God as the fundamental source of these yes. laws. Now, my question is, um, what does it take a physicist to move from that stage to... I don't know. Um, I, it's amazing to me 
that people can see, people of great intelligence can see, they know that the fundamental, they don't claim that science will ever explain what the ultimate laws of physics are. They, they know that those are just somehow givens, that they don't want, wonder where, who gave them, but they, it's a sort of givens for them. And they also see their great beauty and, and richness and, and subtlety and how they cannot, many of them cannot be blind to what, to the religious implications of this, I don't know. But it's, you know, it's actually a question that was asked in the Book of Wisdom. Does anyone have a Bible here with the Book of Wisdom in it? They can hand. Because there's a beautiful thing that I didn't quote where the, where the author of the Book of Wisdom asks exactly that question. It has to be a Catholic Bible to have the book. Oh, good. So if you could, where's the Book of Wisdom? <laughs> um, it's, it's in the wisdom literature, I know that. Um, the Book of Wisdom is, uh, where the heck are you? Here it is. Book of Wisdom, oh, it's right after this, it doesn't have page number. Sirach, it's probably near Sirach. Uh, yes, it's right, before, it's right before Sirach. Oh, you have Wisdom of Solomon, good. It's right before the wisdom, uh, okay, so Wisdom 13, and I hope this is a good translation. So, uh, for all men who were ignorant of God, were foolish by nature, they were unable to, from the good things that are seen, to know him who exists, and it goes on, and it says, uh, for the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. And remember, he started off by saying, for all men were ignorant of God when we were foolish by nature, but this is where he ends up that, that passage. Yet, these men, now who is he addressing this to? This was a Jewish writer of the first century BC in Alexandria, Egypt, which was the intellectual center of the ancient world. And he's talking about Greek philosophers and scientists. So it was a science faith issue then, because you had Jewish wisdom, but you had all the science and, and, and of the ancient Greeks and their philosophy, which claimed to explain the world. So he's addressing the scientists of his day. And he says, yet these men are little to be blamed, for perhaps they go astray while seeking God and desiring to find him. For as they live among his works, they keep searching, and they trust in what they see, because the things that are seen are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yet again, not even they are to be excused, for if they had the power to know so much that they could investigate the world, how did they fail to find sooner the Lord of these things? And I ask myself that all the time. And they are a little bit, because they are, you see, I think he has it psychologically, some of the answer there. They're focused on the things they see. They're focused on the beautiful galaxies or the beautiful phenomena. They're fixated on the phenomena, and they don't raise their eyes, sort of meant their intellectual eyes above that to ask, to find the author of these things. So anyway. Steve. So uh, it's a very sympathetic, they're sympathetic to scientists who are trying to seek God in their own way but fail to find him. Steve, yeah. I just yeah. wanted to make a, so one of the things, one of the last things I did in New Orleans before I came here was work at St. Mary's Dominican High School, which is where Foundations New Orleans has its labs. So next week I'll be there. Um, but I worked with them, they wanted to do a program in which they brought together all of the disciplines with the religion department to learn how to integrate the faith. So for six semesters, we worked with religion and each department. And the second semester, we did mathematics. Um, and that was the hardest for me, because I'm a mathematical clod. Like I, I just don't, I can't get it. My father got his, got his uh, bachelor's degree in math at Brown. My sister was valedictorian in math at the University of New Orleans, and they just would just shake their head. It was so sad to them that I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get more than a C in geometry. Um, but anyway, um, one of the things that we used in that, in that session was a book by the late theologian Stratford Caldecott called oh, yeah. Beauty for Truth's Sta Sake on the Reenchantment of Education. Um, another thing that we did was we looked at the, the architecture of the Middle Ages, especially Shar Cathedral. And um, one of the amazing things, like the Rose Window in Shar, I forget it was the south or the north, um, actually has this perfect geometrical symmetry, right? And in it is built in all of these figures, 
and the middle is virgin and child. And then around it are the prophets. And then around that are Jesus' lineage according to the flesh. And so it's a way of showing that God has taken this mess, and you can point at various people like Manasseh, who sacrificed his children to Moloch, one of the Davidic kings. He's in there. He says uh, that God has taken this mess, this human mess, and here in the middle, we see how it can all come together into a providential plan that we call salvation history. And so you could do the geometry with that, if you were a geometry teacher, right? And actually show, make a, make a kind of a connection to the faith. Um, so, you know, for, the, for, the, for Thierry of Chartres, who was like the kind of theologian mind behind the building of the cathedral, um, he would talk about the spiritual significance of numbers. You know what I mean? And those kinds of things. And how certain numbers, right, had a way of reflecting divinity. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that's just something to throw out there in case you're looking for ways you might take this to to, you know, further those of you who have the capacity to do so, unlike me. Tim, you, you have another? Yeah, back there. Um, uh, Andrew's asking, um, is it fair to say that extinction is, uh, quote, unquote, never ex negative expense of evolution, an example of disorder occurring as an expense of localized order? And not just extinction, but death, because how does a plant grows? It's growing at the expense of the corpse or whatever, the decomposing stuff that it's using as nutrient. I mean, um, right? So we, we live by eating the flesh or, of, or the, the, the bodies of other plants and animals. So that's the expense. <laughs> you see, the, it part of the part of the, the way we, res why aren't we decomposing? Why aren't we coming into thermal equilibrium with our environment? As they say, achieving room temperature, you know? Why are, right now, why is not entropy causing my body to decompose? Well, it turns out you have to have a constant influx of energy to, to, to resist those forces of entropy. Of course, that influx of energy you get at the expense of greater disorder somewhere else. Someone's paying the price for that. As I said, when you put the glass of water in the freezer, the water freezes, it's going from a more disordered state to, the, to ice, which is more orderly. But that's because electricity is coming into your free, uh, freezer, powering that process. Electricity comes in, which is a kind of orderly form of energy, and leaving the back of your refrigerator is heat, which is a more or disorganized form of energy. So someone's paying the price. And when, in our case, it's the animals and plants we're eating that are paying the price because their orderly structures are being broken down and, and, and used as a source of energy for us so that we can stay alive. So it's, you see this in, in evolution and just death is, yeah. Hey, I think that's all the time we have for questions. This is Steve's last presentation. Let's thank him for.